Hello, it's Maria from the Drug Education Network. For those of you who haven't heard of us, DEN, as we are also called, has been around for over 30 years and our core business is to deliver training, information and develop resources aimed at preventing and reducing harm from drug use for people throughout Tasmania. Our approach is based on the idea that we do not condone or condemn drug use, but we acknowledge drug use exists. We aim to meet people where they are at in order to support people to make well-informed decisions around substances. So to begin this session today, on behalf of DEN, I wish to acknowledge the strength, resilience and capacity of the Tasmanian Aboriginal people and their deep and lasting cultural heritage, beliefs and relationship as ongoing custodians of the land and waters of Lutruwita, Tasmania. We recognise that our organisation operates on the land of the traditional custodians and we pay our respect to Elders past and present. DEN is proud to work with the Tasmanian Aboriginal community to prevent the harms caused by alcohol, tobacco and other drugs. In today's session, I'll be talking about Fetal Alcohol Spectrum Disorder or FASD as it is also known. In my research about the School Health Nurse Program in Tasmania, I can see that your role is really important for supporting schools and families with complex health needs, promoting good health and wellbeing, building relationships with students and families and making the connection between education and health, as well as providing advocacy for students and families and also supporting positive parenting for teenagers with babies. As I work through the information about FASD, I think you will recognise the vital role you can play in being more informed about this disability and how you can use your medical knowledge to support teachers and students in better managing their learning and also in a health promotion sense, supporting students' understanding about the risks of alcohol in pregnancy. So my aim is for you to build on your knowledge of the key features of FASD and provide links to information about the diagnostic process. I'll share some resources and linkages to assist you in your work with students who have a FASD diagnosis or not, but require additional health, wellbeing and learning supports for themselves and their family. In terms of your health promotion work in schools, we will look at resources and ideas for how to share the message with young women around being alcohol free during pregnancy. My aim is for you to feel more confident and better equipped in preventing FASD, as well as recognising and responding to students affected by FASD. So at this point, I would like you to imagine a continuum and think about your current level of knowledge and experience. If you were to position yourself on a scale between one and 10, where one is no knowledge and experience and 10 is experienced and confident, where would you be right now? Have a think about what you might need to move towards a more confident, higher score. And I hope that by the end of this session, you will have moved along this continuum towards where you want to be. And please remember that our team at DEN are here to assist you. So if you still have questions, I'll provide our contact details at the end. So FASD, some key information. When thinking about alcohol, we know that it is an accepted part of Australian culture and lifestyle. It is present in our social activities, celebrations, in our toasts to good health at the dinner table and in our shopping centres and supermarkets. However, alcohol misuse is widely recognised as a serious global public health issue. Misusing alcohol can result in a wide range of physical, psychological and social problems affecting the individual, the family and the community. Alcohol misuse is of particular concern for pregnant women. When a mother consumes alcohol in pregnancy, so does her developing baby. The question that has caused some confusion is around the amount of alcohol consumed that can cause issues for the developing baby. You may have heard various media stories, myths and conversations that suggest a low or moderate intake of alcohol doesn't cause serious harm. Professor Elizabeth Elliott AM, who is a pioneer in FASD research, patient care and advocacy, has commented on the serious consequences of misinformation and how the Australian media have represented alcohol consumption during pregnancy. She says, we have to be very careful and the media has to be careful of these issues that are potentially harmful. 
One of the problems that women tell us is that they get mixed messages. They get messages that it's okay, not okay, one drink can hurt them, binge drinking is the only thing that hurts them. This blog recently posted on the site Hello Sunday Morning tells a story that illustrates these consequences. The blog is called I Didn't Know Alcohol Could Harm My Baby Before Knowing I Was Pregnant and it describes a mother's journey after consuming moderate amounts of alcohol early in her pregnancy. Over a long period of time of having questions about her child's development and his behavioural issues, they eventually obtained a FASD diagnosis. In her words, she says about this, I am a birth mother of a child with FASD. I will carry the guilt of unknowingly harming my handsome teenager for the rest of my life. He has a lifelong disability and will need our support for the entirety of his life. However, I will not hide the reasons for my son's challenges with the people who directly support him. I will advocate for my son for a woman's right to information about the potential harms of alcohol to a developing fetus, to help reduce stigma of FASD and to raise awareness amongst the general Australian population to help reduce the occurrence of the most prevalent and preventable disability in the world. So this story reinforces the importance of us as health workers being well informed about FASD and being able to communicate these messages with the young people we are working with. The current National Health Medical Research Council guidelines are very clear in saying, to reduce the risk of harm to their unborn child, women who are pregnant or planning a pregnancy should not drink alcohol. For women who are breastfeeding, not drinking alcohol is safest for their baby. These guidelines are based on the fact that alcohol is a teratogen, which can cause permanent harm to the developing fetus. The central nervous system starts developing very early in the pregnancy and the brain remains sensitive to the harms from alcohol throughout pregnancy. And a key piece of information that informs these current guidelines is that no safe level of alcohol consumption during pregnancy has been identified. The risk of harm to the fetus increases the more the mother drinks and the more frequently she drinks. And when thinking about breastfeeding, maternal alcohol consumption may adversely affect feeding behaviour and sleep patterns of the breastfed baby. Australian and international infant feeding guidelines recommend exclusive breastfeeding for the first six months and then continued breastfeeding while solid foods are introduced until the infant is one year old. So it is important that breastfeeding women know that not drinking alcohol is safest for their baby. Professor Anne Kelso, the CEO of the NHMRC, clarified the intention of these and all recommended drinking guidelines when she says, we're not telling Australians how much to drink, we're providing advice about the health risks from drinking alcohol so that we can all make informed decisions in our daily lives. So now I'm going to talk you through these impacts and then we will have a look at some health promotion approaches that you can use in your work to raise awareness of FASD. So alcohol consumption during pregnancy is linked to a range of adverse consequences, including miscarriage, stillbirth, low birth weight, and fetal alcohol spectrum disorders. FASD is an umbrella term used to describe a range of disabilities that result from prenatal alcohol exposure. Children born with FASD can experience abnormalities including behavioural problems, birth defects, impaired growth and learning difficulties. FASD are the leading preventable cause of non-genetic developmental disabilities in Australia. As is the case with many other disabilities, people who are born with FASD have the condition for life. The primary disabilities associated with FASD are linked directly to the underlying brain damage caused by prenatal alcohol exposure. These can include poor memory, impaired language and communication, poor impulse control, mental, social and emotional delays. In addition to neurological damage, individuals may also have physical impairments ranging from subtle facial abnormalities to organ damage. Alcohol can cause damage to the unborn child at any time during pregnancy. The level of harm is dependent on the amount and frequency of alcohol use. This may be moderated by several factors, including intergenerational alcohol use, parent age, the mother's health, for example, nutrition or tobacco use, and environmental factors such as stress, for example, exposure to violence or poverty. 
the characteristic physical, developmental and or neurobehavioural features that lie within the FASD spectrum are seldom apparent at birth. These may not be noticed until the child reaches school age and behavioural and learning difficulties become problematic. FASD is referred to as the invisible disability as it is often undetected. It may be overlooked, ignored, attributed to other known non-genetic conditions or simply blamed on poor parenting or post-birth environments. There is a lack of understanding of FASD within the service provider community. Currently, assessment and service provision is evidence-based. The presentation of problem behaviours and absence of biomarkers typically leads to unfair assumptions about an individual rather than an offer of helpful strategies. Such strategies should be based on the knowledge that FASD are physical, brain-based conditions with behaviours that are symptomatic of brain damage impairment. It is difficult to determine the prevalence of FASD in Australia due to a lack of accurate assessment, screening and data collection. Various studies using data from states and territories have estimated rates at 0.01 to 1.7 per 1,000 births in the total population. However, it is generally accepted that these figures are likely to underestimate the prevalence of FASD in Australia. A FASD diagnostic instrument was developed in Australia and released in 2016. The web address to access the complete Australian guide for the diagnosis of FASD is fasdhub.org.au. The key point to note here is that a FASD diagnosis requires a full assessment by a multidisciplinary team which consists of a medical practitioner, neuropsychologist, speech language pathologist and occupational therapist. This obviously requires significant resources in terms of time and cost. However, the consensus is that a FASD diagnosis can provide better outcomes for a child or adult in accessing better and more comprehensive wraparound support. The earlier these supports are put in place, the better the chance of preventing what are known as secondary conditions, including but not limited to mental health issues, alcohol and substance misuse, and inappropriate sexual behaviour. Of note also, and described in more detail in the diagnostic instrument, is the fact that facial features do not necessarily need to be present to confirm a FASD diagnosis. In fact, less than 10% of individuals with FASD have the defining facial characteristics. The FASD Hub provides a range of resources for health professionals. I recommend you check it out. I know that I've just been sharing some facts and stats, but it's also important to learn a bit more about people's experiences of FASD. So here are a few quotes from people which are included in a video located on the FASD Hub. Paediatrician Dr James Fitzpatrick says, FASD is everybody's business. Sam, who cares for Jasper, who has FASD, says, I've actually found that it's a lonely journey. Paediatrician Dr Doug Shelton says, FASD needs to come out of the closet. Social worker Robin says, it's probably where ADHD was 20 years ago in Australia. Some scepticism, some, oh, is it real? Sam says, when I got the diagnosis, the first thing that I remember hearing was a permanent brain injury. It could not be fixed. I remember hearing that and it's like my whole world fell apart. Paediatrician Professor Elizabeth Elliott says, there is no typical child with fetal alcohol spectrum disorder. But if you ask parents and teachers, perhaps the most common problem is behavioural problems. Neil, who looks after two children with FASD, says, you know, the fact of the matter is 80% of these children, if they don't have the supports, end up either in an institution, in jail, or living on the streets with health issues. They're just unable to live in the community unsupported, and so you've got to have that knowledge so you can put the supports in place. These quotes provide a brief snapshot of the impacts felt by people who are living with FASD and the misunderstanding that is still prevalent around this neurodevelopmental impairment. In terms of how we can better understand and talk about FASD, there is also a language guide available on the Hub that is really helpful in assisting us as health workers to think about how we talk about this issue and does not perpetuate further stigma and misunderstanding. Another really useful resource is the NoFASD website. As well as providing excellent information about FASD, the website contains great resources for families and carers 
and for people working in the health, community, justice and education sectors. The Education tab of the website provides some great pointers for teachers and potentially this is where your medical knowledge and understanding can support teachers in working more effectively with their FASD affected students. Some key points to think about. International studies suggest there could well be at least one student with FASD in every classroom Australia wide. These children do not respond to traditional instructions and classroom management techniques and it is imperative that all teachers understand and know how to meet their complex needs. Many students with FASD will have normal or sometimes even high intelligence but they still struggle with learning and relating to the world around them and the majority will need a circle of external support for their lifetime. Challenges can be decreased if educators are able to recognise the common behaviours and features of a child with FASD. These may include the following but can vary from child to child. Learning difficulties, don't seem to be learning as well as other children. Impulsiveness, acting without thinking. Difficulty relating actions to consequences, don't learn from mistakes. Social relationships, have trouble making and keeping friends. Attention, hyperactivity, may have been diagnosed with ADHD. Memory, know something one day but seem to forget it the next. And developmental delays, may not reach developmental milestones on time. This resource called FASD in the Classroom is also really helpful to better understand the supports that students need. This could be shared with teachers to provide them with strategies to work more effectively with students that need it. Another useful resource that can be shared with families and caregivers is available from the NoFASD website. This toolkit is called Hope from the Darkness, FASD support for parents and carers in Australia. This toolkit for parents and carers has been designed to provide information that will enable better understanding and increase skills in advocating for them to ensure their physical, emotional and educational needs are met so they have the best life possible. If you are working with students who have a FASD diagnosis, this would be a great resource to share with their families. No FASD is also available to support people who need to access a diagnosis. Here is a number and email to contact them. So to summarise, what I have covered so far, FASD is a lifelong preventable disability. FASD diagnosis requires a multidisciplinary approach. The earlier a diagnosis is made, the better the outcome. In the school setting, there are a range of considerations that need to be taken into account to support students in their learning. There are toolkits and support services available. In particular, no FASD Australia is a highly recommended resource for providing families and carers with support resources and information. So now I'm going to share some information on prevention approaches. The latest data from the National Drug Household Survey from 2019 tells us that nearly two thirds of women are abstaining from alcohol while pregnant, up from 56% in 2016 and 40% in 2007. Of those women who consumed any alcohol while pregnant in 2019, most usually consumed one to two standard drinks on a typical day they drank. 90% of women drank monthly or less, and about one in two consumed alcohol before they knew they were pregnant, and this declined to 14.5% once they knew they were pregnant. This rate has decreased from a rate of 25% in 2016. If we take a look at trends for young people, the results from the most recent survey seem to indicate that young people are increasingly following the NHMRC drinking guidelines, which advise that for anyone aged under 18, not drinking alcohol is the safest option. The average age at which young people aged 14 to 24 first tried alcohol has steadily risen from 14.7 years in 2001 to 16.2 in 2019. The average age of initiation was similar for males and females aged 14 to 24 and increased from 16 in 2016 to 16.3 in 2019 for females. There has also been a long-term increase in the proportion of young people who abstain from alcohol. From 2007 to 2019, the proportion of people aged 14 to 17 who abstained increased from 39% to 73%, 
while for people aged 18 to 24, it rose from 13.1% to 21%. However, we also know that there are still patterns of risky drinking for some age groups. And in 2019, 14.6% of young adults aged 18 to 24 consumed more than 11 standard drinks on one occasion at least monthly. Recognising that half of all Australian women will experience an unplanned pregnancy, it is important that messages regarding the harms of fetal alcohol exposure are emphasised in broader, non-judgmental public health campaigns. The goal of primary prevention is to avert a problem before it begins. This level of prevention acts as a basis for secondary prevention and early intervention and aims to reach the largest number of people, raise awareness and reduce potential stigma and blame. Primary prevention is important for women who lack information, have misconceptions about alcohol misuse and FASD, or need to know how to access services related to alcohol use across their lifespan, and particularly during pregnancy. Tailored messages may be required for girls and women based on age, income, ethnicity and other differences. Research has shown that women would tend to avoid preventative health messages that they perceive as too alarmist or extreme. Balancing this with the need to provide consistent and unambiguous information about the risks of even minimal fetal alcohol exposure is challenging. And the work that has been done in FASD prevention in Canada highlights this important point. People don't change because they see a poster, they change because they see a poster in the context of a place they trust and then a conversation starts and then you go from there. This highlights the importance of your role as a school health nurse and the relationship of trust that you build with the students you work with. As this trust develops, you become a trusted source of information, which is how you can influence positive change. To give you some insight on the level of awareness of alcohol impacts, a Telethon Institute study found that pregnant women had some level of knowledge about not drinking too much. They had little idea, however, of the impact of alcohol and how it actually affected a baby's development in either the early stages when they do not know they are pregnant or throughout their pregnancy. Additional research has also shown that a survey of women found that they wanted a clear message. They wanted to be advised of the safest option not to drink in pregnancy with 99% saying that information about the effects of alcohol on the foetus should be readily available, and 97% said health professionals should ask women about their alcohol use in pregnancy. 91% said that health professionals should advise women who are pregnant or thinking of becoming pregnant to give up drinking alcohol. So in terms of primary prevention strategies, which are population-based interventions designed to reduce alcohol-related harms, this research indicates that there are opportunities to share prevention messages with preconceptual girls and young women, and that this information needs to be culturally sensitive to the community where it is being delivered. It must be respectful, be informed by community knowledge, attitudes and practices, focus on the damage that alcohol can do, not focus blame on the woman, engage not only women but all the community, including men, and be consistent with the Australian guidelines to reduce health risks from drinking alcohol. At DEN, we have developed a campaign that aims to connect with younger audiences. We developed these messages that were focus tested with young people in order to understand what messages would resonate best. As you can see, we are also aiming to broaden this message for dads and same-sex partners to support their pregnant partner in being alcohol-free during pregnancy. And we have also focused on broader networks to reinforce the message that pregnant women should be supported in their choice to be alcohol free. These postcards and posters are available from the DEN resources page, so check out this link to order your free copies. These resources could be used as part of an awareness raising or health promotion campaign that could link with International FASD Awareness Day, which happens on the 9th of September each year. The other key message to share with students is to reinforce the social norms that are changing around drinking by highlighting the stats that show more young people are abstaining from alcohol or waiting until they are older to start drinking. Additionally, raising awareness of the risk of binge drinking in terms of accidents and injuries and where this intersects with unplanned pregnancy are other opportunities to begin the conversation. 
And in case you were wondering, a binge is now defined as more than four standard drinks on a single occasion. Universal screening is another recommended primary prevention strategy that can happen at every health screening appointment with adolescent girls. This can take the form of simply asking about alcohol use or using validated screening tools that are also applicable for use with young people. Two examples of commonly used tools are the audit and the assist. Take note also, if asking about drug use, that young women may not necessarily recognise that alcohol is a drug. And so think about specifically asking about alcohol consumption. When it is delivered effectively in the context of a brief conversation, screening is inclusive, non-stigmatising and effective at targeting preconceptual girls and pregnant women. To sum up then, the health promotion strategy and message is succinct. Inform all individuals of the phases in life when alcohol should not be used and why. During childhood and adolescence, when planning a pregnancy or during pregnancy and breastfeeding. In considering secondary prevention approaches, this level targets adolescent girls and women who have been identified as being at risk for alcohol use in pregnancy. This strategy involves screening for problematic alcohol use, followed by education, brief intervention and referrals to any appropriate helping resources and support. The third level of prevention is early intervention. This approach is intended to reach adolescent girls and women at highest risk by offering specialised holistic support through outreach care and collaborative networks of current agencies. The benefits of this strategy include continued support for breastfeeding mothers in the postpartum period, support for women who have been able to reduce and need support to manage their alcohol use post-pregnancy, mitigating relapse in women for whom alcohol use continues to be problematic. You may find this resource, the FASD Handbook for Health Professionals, is useful to refer to in undertaking this prevention work. It includes a resources toolbox, and in the situations where you may be working with young pregnant women, there is also a quick reference guide for using the Audit C and the 5 A's model. Check out the DEN resources page if you would like to order or access an online copy of this resource. So, I have come to the end of this presentation about FASD, where we have looked at the causes, impacts, features, support options and recommended prevention approaches that I hope will be helpful in your work as school health nurses. To finish, I invite you to think back on the question that I posed at the beginning. Have you moved along the continuum in terms of having increased understanding and confidence on the topic of FASD and how to use this information in your work? And here are our contact, web address and Pinterest details as places to source more information and lesson ideas. Our Pinterest page is divided into a range of boards. Take a look at our FASD board with articles specifically focused on all things FASD as well as a range of alcohol and drug resources for school nurses. Find these and more inside the Drug Education Board. We would also like to know if this session has been useful for you. So we invite you to point your phone camera at the QR code on the screen, type in the link to open a survey that can be completed anonymously. Also, feel free to contact us if you want to organise any further training or need support for any of your health promotion or educational work. You can also subscribe to our monthly newsletter, which will keep you updated on all events, training and new resources at DEN. Thanks for listening.